Good morning. Good morning. And how is everyone doing on this wonderful morning? Great. It's a little damp and chilly, but it could be a lot worse place than right here. So let's be happy we're here, man. Yeah. Announcements in which we'll uh, have um, Sunday school resume at 10 a.m. on January 3rd. The SPR committee will have a meeting with the DS on Wednesday, January 6th, beginning at 7 p.m. Meeting will be at Pine Forest. There are some 2021 calendars left. If anybody hasn't got theirs, I, I don't know the number, but there is some back there yet. So if anybody is still looking for a 2021 calendar, uh, let Dawn know and she can get one for you. Um, candlelight service, December 24th. Jimmy Cox is going to come and speak with our service again this year. And it will start at 5 o'clock. So that's December 24th, candlelight service at 5 o'clock. Um, got a little note here from Kathy Hart. Kathy Hart called and wanted to wish everyone a season's greeting, and she loves and misses each one of us. I haven't seen Kathy in a long time since she moved to Milledgeville, so I hope uh, she's doing well. You know, we all want to be missed and loved, and she does for us, so that, uh, that's a treasure we can have for Christmas. Uh, any other announcements in which I have missed? If not, uh, Debbie, would you come down and tell us a little bit about your coffee cup ministry, please? And this is Debbie Cox. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for distributing to this and um, helping uh, bring things to go inside the cups and um, bringing the cups. And um, I'd just like to thank everybody for doing that. Um, we had so many, it's like they just multiplied. I didn't think we'd have this many, but we have over 50 cups up here. And um, we didn't have room for about three more, so I just stuck up there with the manger scene because we're going to bless these cups this morning anyway. Um, but um, I just want y'all to know how much this means to me. Um, a couple of years ago, I just had this thought in my mind while I was doing my Bible study, and I thought, coffee cup ministries, it just came in my mind. And I thought, well, you know, the Lord has just put something in my mind that I need to do, and I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget, and uh, which I didn't forget. And um, it was simple things matter. Just something simple. So what I wanted, like, what it was like, uh, used cups that somebody has drunk out of, or either just a regular cup that you bought that you know just means a lot to you, you know, just to just to buy a cup, and just put simple things in there like candy or just anything, not much, but just a little, just to let people know that um, we're thinking about them, and most of all that Jesus loves them, and so we put some Bible verses in there and. Um, made sure that I wrote on there simple things matter because you know some people they think about oh a used coffee cup you know why would somebody give me a used coffee cup when they read it they'll understand why so uh, that's why you know this is up here and so these cups need to go to people that you know that needs to be lifted up that's having a hard time or people that are doing good that just needs an uplifting and People that are uh, by themselves, homeless, in nursing homes, family, anybody that you want to just um, give them just a lift, you know, to, to let them know that Jesus loves them and that um, he takes care of us. And that's the main reason. So uh, after church, if y'all would take a coffee cup or more than one, any, as many as you want, um, and whatever's left, I'll take to somebody. So um, I just want y'all to feel free to take as many cups as you like. 
with you to distribute them out. So, uh, Tommy, you want to come bless these cats for us? Let's pray together. Father God, we pause just for a moment to say how thankful we are for a church that reaches out beyond the four walls in this cut ministry as well as the quilting ministry and the other projects that they have undertaken over the years because it is an expression of an outpouring of a love that they all have for you. It is a way that they reach out and, and sing the good news of the gospel. And I pray, Father, for every person that was involved in this, Lord, that you would pour out a special blessing upon them. I thank you for Debbie's leadership in it. And I pray, O oh God, that uh, every recipient, Lord, would feel the warmness and the nudge and a hug from the Holy Spirit. And that, Father, that they would know that they are not forgotten, that they are loved by you and by us, Lord. And I pray, O oh God, that... Um, that on this day that you would anoint each one of these and send them to that person that so desperately needs that moment of, of grace and that moment of hope and that moment of cheer. Bless these, your children. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Debbie. You know, you don't know this is going to affect or who it's going to affect so if there's someone out there like Debbie said go ahead and help yourself because these are given with love to anybody that needs it and if you know of a shut in a person that's in a nursing home that just and you know if you are bedridden or if you are house or a uh, have to stay in your house you know just how important it would be to someone visit you say hi and then offer them a gift that's that's true love uh, let's stand and uh, song number 217 away in the manger light the fourth candle of Advent. With the first three candles burning, a family member lights the fourth candle. We hear your angel Gabriel and witness the faith of Mary. Fill us with your grace and light. Mary was a young, strong, spiritual woman, but even though her life was not easy, she heard God's voice and said yes. 
Her song was a prayer that would uplift those who were downtrodden. Her lyrics shattered the proud and called the world to change. She would bear within her the promised child, Jesus, the light of the world. This Advent, we respond to God's beckoning to us as well. A prayer revealing God. Visit us and fill us with your spirit. Bring your good news to life within us. Give us courage to carry your light into the injustices and shadows of the world. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Um, prayer list is Deborah Shepherd, Betsy Fitzwitt, Wes Moy, and Bud Grizzard. Um, I don't know, but Bud Grizzard, Barbara called me, was it Sunday or Monday? Said that he was taken to the hospital with COVID. So. I have not heard. I don't know if anyone else heard uh, how well he's. Nancy? Okay. So Bud had a mild case of COVID, and they'll keep him there a couple, a couple of days. Prayer list is Tommy Shepard, Gracie Pope. Michelle Gardento's mother, family of Bunny Hatchard, Travoyas Head Thomas, Danny Fisher, and family of loss of their grandmother. Is there anyone else we need to add to this list? Dawn? Yes. Uh, Dawn Wood, Betsy Cro uh, Becky Crosby, Cindy Williams, Johnny Webb. Anyone else? Daniel Yarber. Who? I have not heard. Has anyone heard from Barbara Kurt? Oh, that, that's reason. That's reason enough to stay at home. I mean, you know, it's cold and damp and wet. And You've had a year of it already. Yeah. Plus, you never know, you know, just being out in the dampness and the coldness, you could, um, you could get sick, you know, cold or whatever, and then, then you're susceptible for other things. So is there anything else or anyone else, I should say, that we need to add to the list? If not, Tommy. Father God, it is in this season that we're reminded of such a great love that you sent your little son, Lord, to grow to be a, a big, strong man, to surrender to your will completely and unconditionally, to die on an old rugged cross that we might be here today with hope 
and with a certain amount of peace about us that we know, oh God, that when we trust in you, that we are in your hands, that we are in your care. And when we are faithful with that, Lord, that at that point in time in our journey, that we will be received unto you. And Father, we thank you for that promise. And Father, you heard so many names that were lifted up this morning and some needs are so private and personal that we choose not to say them aloud. But we know folks around us and we know folks that are in our families that are hurting for various reasons. We know uh, there are turmoil in families across America and across the world, even in our communities, Lord. And I pray that this time of peace, Lord, that peace would be upon them, that reconciliation would be a part of the, the families, a part of the churches, and a part of, of what happens in your kingdom in this time that uh, we're uh, really out of control of what's going on, Lord. And I pray, Father, for our world leaders. I pray, O oh God, that they would seek peace and not war. I pray, Father, for this transition that we are about to undertake. I pray, O oh God, that your hand would be upon us and upon our leadership. And that, Father, that you would get us and them out of the way. And that your will be done. And I pray, Father, for the church as a whole and the struggle that we're in to be the church. And I pray for our leadership that we would be strong, that we will be forceful, that we would be intent on doing what your word says and in holding fast, Lord, to your scriptures. And Father, once again, we just thank you for loving us so much. Pray a special anointing on um, Beverly as she is here today, as she begins uh, her role as pastor of this church in just a few short Sundays. We pray, O oh God, that you would anoint her with a spirit beyond anything that she's ever felt before. Give her the sermons, the words, the deeds, and all that needs to be done, Father, to, uh, to help this church uh, be the church that you've called it to be. And Father, uh, just bless Don, Don as he's uh, over at Pine Hill by himself. Just grow him up over there. He'll be fine without her. And uh, Father, we just thank you for this couple that love you so much. And I pray, Father, that uh, you would be with each of us as we are here this morning. We invite you, God, to orchestrate this service in song and in deed and in word, Lord. And uh, help us to be teachable. Father, as you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Tommy. Um, let's stand and sing, O Come All Ye Faithful. Oh, 
True God of true God, light from light eternal, lo, he shines not the virgin's womb. Son of the Father, be God not created. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. See how the shepherds summon to His cradle, leaving their flocks drawn to grace we to we thither bend our joyful footsteps oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him Christ the Lord Oh, Lordy, Yale, I missed the choir. Because I don't have to hear myself sing, John, with the choir behind me. Our scripture reading this morning, and we missed Dawn today, too. Because... Uh, was that Joe Biden calling for you, Tom? Yeah. Once the plane to his cabin. <laughs> <laughs> um, Beverly, you're going to get used to the screens and the work that they do for you with the screens. And, uh, and you get used to them, and then you go somewhere else, and they don't have them. It's, it, it just doesn't quite feel right. But that's a wonderful... Um, a part of the ministry here, and uh, and Don does a great job, and I thank Jake for everything that he's doing. He's back and forth and just everywhere, and uh, we appreciate it. I, I know y'all know how blessed you are to have him with you, uh, being able to do all that. Um, I want to ask you to take your Bibles this morning, just get there and hold it to the 10th chapter of the book of John. John 10, just get there. You don't have the scripture on your uh, screen today, so you're going to have to do it the old-fashioned way, John. Uh, so John chapter 10. Now, I want you to do something for me this morning. I want you to just look at your arm. Just look at your own arm now. Don't look at somebody else's arm. Tell him which one, Joyce. What is at the end of your arm? A hand. Yeah. Yeah, a hand. And if you look at that hand, and, and uh, you'll see how wonderfully it's made. And when arthritis sets in, you know where every joint is in it and all the little intricate parts uh, that has an effect on it. You know where they, those are. And you know that I guess each hand is created with a, a different level of dexterity. You look at Jake, for instance. He can sit over here and play the piano. He can run over there and play the organ. He can do whatever it is he does with all this stuff to get the Facebook up and going. And it's almost as if he never does it. I don't ever see him doing anything with it. But what's amazing about that is just a few years ago, you couldn't play anything, could you? And then all of a sudden, he just kind of grew up and woke up, and God has gifted him with a talent. And you, you set some of us, with the exclusion of Melanie, back there to a piano, and we're just a mess, aren't we? And you take Ruby back there, you give her a, a needle and a... Uh, a piece of thread and she can do some absolutely amazing things with that. 
I do pretty good with that. I can sew a button on if I can, if I can hold it long enough. It may not button right, but at least it's buttoning. And Steve, we're going to figure out something you can do. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out before the service is over with. But uh, it, isn't it amazing that God gifted so many with so many ways that, uh, that you can use your hands to do? Part of Christmas is just looking back and thinking back of days gone by. And we got a couple of young folks with us, and some of the things that probably I'll say to you, they may not recognize. But, you know, we did a Christmas here several years ago, and that's about what we did. We just remembered, and everybody told stories about Christmas and what it was like when you were a child and the things that you remember that you did at Christmas. And for those of us who grew up on a farm and grew up basically you know, in, in poor, I'll to say that, uh, we made do with what we had, and it made a lot of wonderful memories that we still hold on to. And, and my children are carrying their children through some of the same traditional things that we did. And I want to focus on, on hand this morning, or, or hands, and some of the sayings that you really don't hear too much anymore, you remember the one that, uh, and this is one of the things that I think probably is happening in our America, it's the hand that rocks the cradle does what? Rules the world. Well, who's rocking the cradle now? You know, in our, in our homes, in a family setting as it is, who is, who is rocking that cradle? And you know that... that we still use this term periodically, but have you ever stopped in the business of your schedule and asked someone, do you need a hand up? Or has anyone ever asked you that? Have you ever been to that point in your life, in your life's journey, that you really needed a hand up? I have. And, and, and I think that's one of the reasons that when we need that hand up, we have a greater appreciation for that place in your journey and that we can more readily offer the hand up to someone else. How many years and how many times over Father's Day do we remember that, that song, Daddy's Hands? And I think probably if all of us would, would think back, or most of us, that's one of the things that, that we think about is, is our father's hands. And I know my daddy had old, old big hands. They were short fingers like mine, big hands, but daddy's hands were calloused and hard and, uh, and, and because my father worked. And I remember, you know, the same thing. I don't know how many of you have the same problem that a lot of us have is your hands get hard and dry and just crack and hurt and carry on with my father's hands. I, re I remember that. And so, um, and one of the things, John, that uh, we know and remember is when you uh, walk up to somebody, and, and Papa John was a handshaker now, and many of you are too, is that we miss shaking hands, don't we, John? And uh, this bump and elbow stuff, but it's, you can tell a lot about shaking a person's hand. And I'm going to be honest with you. If a guy comes up to me and shakes my hand and it's like picking up a, a wet noodle, then mm, there's just something about that. It isn't quite right, is it, John? You need a firm handshake. And I think it, it, it says a lot about who you are. We as United Methodists, and we're still united. We as United Methodists. John Wesley said, give me your right hand of fellowship. Giving and offering that right hand of fellowship is a sign of friendship. And it's also a sign that, that of a willingness to help. Debbie, what are you all doing here? You, you have shown that you're willing to help those who can't be here and those who are shut in and those who may can't get out, those who want to be here but can't be here uh, under the reasons. And for the folks that are on Facebook, 
You know, we understand that. And so, and, and respect and honor that. Um, one of the other things that, um, Tom, I just didn't feel good about doing, but I did because it was a cultural norm. When we were in Africa, you know, you stood around, a bunch of guys stood around, and you stood in a circle, and all the men were standing there holding hands. And there were six of us, and that was the only ones that we knew, but we stood there with everybody else holding hands, and I kept looking around to see if anybody else. I, you, don't, you don't never go anywhere that somebody don't come up that you know. And I didn't want anybody from South Georgia to come up that knew me. But, but you know, that's, that's the culture, and we don't do that here. But for parts of the world, they stand and they hold hands. And two men can be standing there and they'll be having conversation and they're holding hands. And it is a bond that they have, a friendship and a, a common tie that ties them together out of a common good. And we unfortunately see that uh, in so many other ways. If I told you 12 hands high, what would that mean to you? Probably wouldn't mean anything to our younger folks because unless, unless you periodically look at horse races or the Kentucky Derby or something, you wouldn't really know that because we're far removed from horses now. But, you know, that's the buying, selling, trading of I got a mare I want you to buy. How tall is it? She's ten hands high. And everybody knows, you know, how high, John, you remember that, how, how high a horse is by that. So that's one of those things that's got uh, away from us. And Carolyn, when is the last time here at Gethsemane we sang he's got the whole world in his hands? I mean, Tom, we used to sing that when we were little, didn't he? I would sing it, but I'd rather not. Y'all had rather not. <laughs> But you know, he's got the whole wide world in his hands. And somewhere in our time, we've just, uh, we've let that fall away and we're not uh, singing that anymore. How many of you like that commercial? You're in good hands with all steak. I'm sorry, Jake from Steak Farm. <laughs> but you're in good hands with all steak. And how many of you remember there's a time that uh, you would hear an older person say, I got to go back because I got to pick up the hands and go to the field. You remember that? That's probably one of those terms now would not be Beverly politically correct, but that's how we grew up. It referred to all of us that, that it, we were the workers in the field. We were the hands that, that did the work. And for those of us who were in the military, do you remember raising your right hand? You know, I do solemnly swear to protect the country and uphold, yada, yada, yada. Um, if you ever been in court, you uphold, you hold your hand up. You know, I do swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth. So it is that, that symbol of holding up that right hand and making a promise and making a, a plea on that. And how many of you remember those little handprints that was all over the mirror, all over the refrigerator, all over the door when they came in playing in the mud and they tried to push the door open before they turned the, the knob, all over the French glass doors on the mirror, I mean on the, the little window panes on the door, and they were little handprints just all over the house. Y'all remember those, don't you? But it's a memory now, isn't it? And those little handprints, and how many of you remember, uh, Debbie, y'all used to do it. You, you made the plaster and you put the kids' hands down in, in there. You probably, some of you still got those home somewhere with the names on them. But how many of you, over the years, you fussed about having to clean up the handprints, and now you wish they were there. And now you wish you could see those little hands just one more time. You see how things change and how we forget sometimes how, how precious some things are? Those things are now a memory rather than a 
a reality. The Bible mentions hands approximately 1,500 times. And I thought this morning that we would deal with each one of them and discern the true meaning. So when we leave here this afternoon, we'll have an understanding <laughs> of what hands are all about. But I think one of the, one of the, probably the best places in the Bible to have a little clearer understanding of what hands are about is in the book of Jeremiah. And that's when Jeremiah is at the potter's house. And when Jeremiah is, is watching the potter do what the potter does, he's watching that potter with his hands forming a vessel. And if you've ever seen that, it is an absolute true art that you, you sit and you watch someone take a piece of clay and form something special out of basically nothing. And Jeremiah watched that potter make that vessel. And then the next thing that he watched was the potter destroy the vessel. And that tells us two basic things. One is the hands that God has given to all of us, to His children, in His creation, those hands can create. Jake can create beautiful music. Ruby can create wonderful things to wear. We can create with our hands or we can destroy with our hands. We can crush and kill and destroy. We can do good with our hands or we can either do evil with our hands. And you know whose choice that is? That's our choice. We choose which we will do. One of the other places in the Bible is that, that place that, that Jacob and, and Esau are being born. And you remember what Jacob was doing? Jacob was grasping for Esau's heel. And you know it's interesting to note that as you read that story, it makes no mention of what the mother was going through out of, out of all that that was going on between those two boys. And that storyline that God gave us in the birth of, of two, basically two nations, He gives us that, that image that we see in our minds of one child grasping after the other. But it also sees in our mind that you and I are much like both of those children, that we are much like Jacob. Because what was Jacob doing? Jacob was grasping at the heel of Esau. How many of us, when we were young, when we were trying to figure everything out, we spent a lot of our time, a lot of our energy, and a lot of our should have been with our family time, grasping at straws. There's another term you don't hear much anymore. Grasping at straws. Or trying to re reach and grasp that brass ring. That we were going to make it, and whatever else, it, it would fall by the wayside because it was not important. And then one day we woke up, and we saw that our children were either grown or almost grown, and we had missed a lot of their lives because we were grasping at what was material rather than receiving and staying with and holding on to the blessing that God had given to us. And I think a lot of times in our life when we're young particularly, is that we're reaching and grasping for that thing that is unattainable. What Jacob was grabbing and reaching for, for him it was not, but for God's plan it was, it was unattainable. 
And you know a lot of times we want to be something real bad. But that's not what God wants us to be. And Beverly, I know you know. But for, for personal reference, I've never had that peace that washed over or I felt until I surrendered to the call of ministry because I tried a lot of things and nothing else, Gail, fit. And when I gave all, then that peace washed over that this is what I want you to do. You can't tell that to young folks. You can't tell that to a lot of folks who are, who are trying to reach that unattainable. And that's what Jacob was doing. He's grasping for something that he could not have. I want you to think about Paul's hands. I can't imagine what Paul's hands looked like because Paul was a tent maker. And you know, to a degree, that had to be kind of a, a rough life. But I want you to imagine Paul in a setting with those old rough hands that he had sitting there making a tent, repairing a tent, whatever the need was. But it was not the tent making that was important. The tent making was only the avenue by which he gained entrance into that group or into that circle. And when he was received in that circle, guess who he began to talk about? He began to talk about Jesus. And so he used the gift that God had given to him to be able to be a tent maker, repairing or making tents with a group of other folks. And as they sat there, he began to talk to them about his Savior. He began to witness. Isn't that a wonderful opportunity to be able to share and to witness? You just kind of, um, Gail, you just kind of slide it in the back door. And because they have a respect for who you are and your trade and what you're doing, then they will begin to listen more easily to what you have to say. And so God took and used him. And I know those old hands were calloused. Have you ever noticed how a little baby, when you're playing with that little baby, and who can't play with a little baby? You've got to make all them funny, uh, crazy adult sounds and all that kind of stuff. But you've just got to do that to a baby. And you, I remember when you were there, Jake. That tells me how old I am. And uh, what is one of the little things that that baby will eventually do? If you hold your hand long enough, that baby will wrap his hand around your finger, won't they? They'll just hold on to your finger. Isn't that a precious thought? Don't you know that some 2,000 years ago when Jesus was born, don't you know that in that place... Uh, Mary and Joseph are playing with him just like a normal little bitty baby. And what did Jesus do? Babies are babies. They reached and, uh, he did, reached and grabbed mom and dad's and whose ever finger was, was close to them. And that same, same little finger, that same little hand reached for Mary and Joseph is the same hand that washed the disciples' feet. We were talking a little bit last Sunday about being servants, about serving. Isn't that the extreme the example, the epitome of service, even, even the one who would betray him? And so in that, we see those hands washing the feet of, of those who were close. To, even those hands, dipped into the same bowl as the bowl with the bowl of the one who would betray him. That same hand did. And so we see that as, as a sign of love. Those same hands were stretched out openly and freely in love and nailed to an old rugged cross 
just for you and just for me. Isn't that, isn't that a wonderful uh, thought, even at Christmas, anytime during the year? And those same hands for many of folks just like you and I have been and hope that we're not any longer, is those same hands reached out and told Thomas, you know, in South Georgia lingo, here, here I am, reach out and touch. That's the same hand that was nailed to the cross. That's the same hand that spit on the ground, made some mud, and put it on a fellow's eye and caused healing. Isn't that what we need in our world today? For the hand of God to cause healing. Because we're, we're sick more than just COVID-19. We are so sin sick in our world. And I think, Carolyn, this is a result of that disobedience. And if you read your Old Testament, you'll see the parallels that run through that. Satan has a place in this also. We don't like to think about it, especially around Christmas. But he does. Because... If you'll go back and, and read and see that Job was handed over into the hands of Satan. And you see, you and I are created with a, a free will, a choice. And God loves us so much that He allows us to make that choice. And we can choose. We either want to be in the hands of God or the hands of Satan. Either or. But it becomes our choice. So our hands can be used for either good or for evil. Now, I want to read you a little part of what John recorded that Jesus said in John 10, and I'm going to begin in verse uh, 25. And Jesus answered, I, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I did in my Father's name speak for me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now, for the sake of spending a long time in that passage, Jesus is saying to basically to the Jews, your unbelief, you don't see the miracles that I'm performing because you don't believe. And he said, this is, this is something that I want you to know that when you believe and when you have faith and when you trust in me, nothing happens here on this earth that can snatch you out of my hand. And folks, we need to hear that today because all this is going on, whether it's um, the plague or whether it's politics or whether it's just evil or whether whatever it is, all this is happening in our world and our world is winding down. As long as we believe and as long as we trust and as long as we have faith, the promise to us is that none of this can remove us out of God's hand. Isn't that a wonderful place to be in God's hand? And Jesus emphasizes that even more. And He said, for those of you who believe, those... The Father has given them to me and you are in God's hands as well and nothing can snatch you out of God's hand. And he said, I and the Father am one. So if we're in Jesus' hands, then what? We are also in God's hands. And nothing can remove us from that. Isn't that a, a thought of, of hope? Isn't that a thought of, of peace? Isn't that a thought of assurance that we feel that we need to feel in this time? Now, the question 
gets to be, how do you get in God's hand? Well, you get in God's hand by accepting the Son because it tells you a little bit ahead of that that, um, that if we want to be His sheep, then we listen to His voice, we obey His voice, we know His voice, and if we know Him and accept Him, then we enter into that relationship and then we are in His hands. The way that we get into God's hands is through the Son. The way that we stay into God's hands is being faithful. The way that we get into God's hands is being fully and totally, unconditionally surrendered to God's will and accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now, I want to say this to you, and then we'll, we'll close. If you're not sure, and this is for us and, and for the folks on Facebook, wherever you are. If you're not sure, and if you want to come to this altar, and you want to pray social distancing, we'll honor that. And I've not advocated this over the years, but if you want to stay right where you are and pray a prayer of assurance, you do that as well. But here's one of the things that I think we've done over the years is that we have, we're socially distancing for common sense for good reasons. But I think what we've done over the years as a nation is we have put ourselves at a distance from God. And I think, John, we're reaping the, the benefits of that. That we're, we're seeing the fruit of disobedience. Doesn't the Bible teach us something about drawing nigh? Yeah. So we need to draw close to God while we're in this place of being kind of apart from each other. And if we want to stay and get in the hand of God, then we do that through the Christ child. And be we do that by accepting His Son. And where is His Son? He is seated where? At the right hand of God. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, help us to enter into that we're in His hands relationship. And help us, O oh God, to just uh, anything, barrier that stands between us and You. I pray, O oh God, that this morning that that wall will be torn down. That we can be in, in Your hands. And that we can have that peace and that assurance that we know. And understand, Lord, that we are there through an eternity. Not just here on this earth but through an eternity. And I pray, O oh God, that you would uh, just help us to make that decision. And once we make it, help us to live in it. Let us find that joy that we need, that joy that's ever so contagious that those who are around us, Lord, will want to know why. And help us to have the gumption, the courage, the words to say it is because of a relationship that we have with our Lord and Savior and that we're in His hands and nothing going on in this world can snatch us from that. Bless these, your people. Bless this church. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for sending the Christ child as a little bitty baby. And we thank you, Lord, for uh, just so many examples that He set for us that we can apply them to our lives, Lord. Let the gospel message be applicable in all ways. In Christ, Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. <clears throat>
things that young people don't remember. Remember Paul Harvey? Everybody remembers Paul Harvey, right? The rest of the story. Earlier this week, I was listening to the radio, and I didn't know if it was his son or who it was, but he was telling the rest of the story. And again, thinking of what Tommy was talking about, the innkeeper that Mary and Joseph had to go to in the cave, in the manger, or in the cave. Um, There was no room at the end. So he had the the cave where the animals. He said the innkeeper got a bad rap, but the cave with the animals in there was probably warmer for a newborn baby than the inn in which people were. You know when you get all those people there for that uh, census taken, there's going to be a lot of rowdy people there. And there's going to be drinking and all sorts of stuff. People stand, spending, staying up all night, going to the manger and to where these animals were. It was much warmer, much more quiet, and actually was a better place for a baby to be born than in that inn. But the whole moral of this story is the innkeeper did the best he could. That was the best he had for our Lord. Are we given our best? And that's the rest of the story. Let's stand and sing uh, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. Which now the angels 
God, we anoint Johnny with, Johnny with the spirit of the Father and of the Son. And I pray, O oh God, that you would just anoint him with the healing that he needs. And that, Father, that these tests would be better than uh, anything that they could ever imagine. I pray for he and his family as they wait anxiously, anxiously for the results. I pray for travel mercies. I pray in the confusion and, and all the stuff that's going on in these hospitals today that you would keep them safe and let it go by quickly, Lord, and easily and just give them a good trip. And I pray, Father, that, um, that your hand of healing would already be at work with him. And I pray, oh God, that you would just watch over not only him, but all those that we mentioned in our prayer time and on our prayer list and, and those who are not with us today because of, of some type of illness. I pray, oh God, that you would just let your spirit fill this place and that you would just anoint us, Father, that we can be your hands and feet. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Bless you. Amen. I believe that I could have liked a part of it. Don't want to back up. I'll pray for them. I don't know until then. Can we do it? It's going to be bad if we drive. Where did you go? Where did you go? Where did you go? Oh, my God.